Well, good morning and welcome to Noah's Window. Uh, as you, if you've been with us the last couple of days, you know we're having a little fun on Noah's Window, but at the same time, it's not just fun, it's a great exercise. Our, our challenge is to find ourselves in some character in the Bible. And we understand that God hasn't made us all the same. He hasn't given us all the same assignments. So he's sort of put us together the way he wants us uh, with our personalities and our gift packages and, and even maybe some of the challenges that we face. And, and it's interesting if you can find a character in the Bible who reminds you of yourself. Uh, it's interesting to look at that, but it, it's bigger than just being interesting because if we can learn how God interacted with that character and see what their strengths were and their weaknesses were, we really can, we can help ourselves a lot. I think I gave this verse to you in the first episode this week that all these stories were given to us as our examples. So uh, it's fun. It's fun to find yourself in the Bible. And it, it may be that there's one character that you really identify with, or it could be that there's like, you know, you identify with half of this character and half of this character. And there's so many different personalities. But I'm looking at five of the ones that I've watched uh, in my own life. And I started with my own personality. I called it Bright Colors. We pulled it from the stories of Elijah and Peter, uh, where there's great strengths. You know, there's bright strengths, but also some bright challenges. And uh, sometimes these characters are enormously effective, and then sometimes they just sort of shut down. Uh, it, it is an interesting personality type, and, and God uses this, but our challenges are great as well. And then we talked yesterday about the disciplined thinker, and we pulled that out of the life of the Apostle Paul because he had a great mind, and he had the ability to absorb a lot of information, to understand complex systems, and then to teach us how we can access those uh, complex understandings. I think that's the reason why the Holy Spirit had Paul write over half of the New Testament, you know, and when I read books like Romans, I see this great mind that God gave Paul helping me understand really, really deep, complex issues. And so for all of you who have those wonderful disciplined minds, may God bless you and your blessing to all the rest of us. Uh, this third, uh, third personality is probably the one I respect the most at least I admire the most. And uh, the, I was saying to Mary Alice before the camera started rolling that uh, this is the personality I see in her. And so maybe it's because I've lived with her all these years and I just admire this personality so much. Uh, for lack of better terms, we'll just call this the reluctant but victorious warrior. If you have this profile, you see yourself as ordinary. You tend to be a follower. You like to stay in the background, and yet at some point in your life, the Holy Spirit summons you to the front of the action. And, and if you have this personality type, your first response is probably, who me? Uh, and you may even add something to that, who me? You got to be kidding. But oftentimes we see men and women in the Bible who were great heroes. They didn't, they didn't see themselves as a hero, and they really didn't even ask to be at the front of the action, but God summoned them. And so let's let's talk about that personality for just a few moments. If I'm trying to find a character in the Bible who, uh, who ex exemplifies this, the first person I'm going to think about is Esther. Her story occurs chronologically at the end of the Old Testament, even though the book is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but, you know, Judah is in captivity. And uh, first of all, the Babylonians came and took Judah captive. And now the Persians are in control. And the Persian kings were sort of neutral toward the Jews at first, but then something bad happened. And actually, there are two events that happen at the same time. One's good and one's bad. Let me get the good one out of the way, and then I'll talk about the bad thing. Uh, the king got mad at the queen and fired her for being insubordinate. And so he needed a new queen. They had a beauty contest, and a young Jewish girl by the name of Esther became his favorite. And strangely enough, this Jewish girl became queen. Esther did not reveal her nationality, but she went from being basically an unimportant person in the kingdom to being the queen of Persia. That's the good thing that happened. The bad thing that happened was there was this guy named Haman who was kind of a type, he was sort of a, a foretype of, of Hitler. Uh, you know, Hitler tried to wipe out the Jewish people during World War II. Well, Haman hated the Jews and he wanted them dead. He was second in command to the Persian king. And the king was kind of distracted. I mean, we know him already. He's Esther's husband. He's the king. He rules in the whole empire. But he could be distracted and leave matters of state to some of his assistants. And of course, one of them was this wicked Haman who went to the king and said, there are some divisive, disruptive people in the kingdom. They're called Jews. We would be way better off if we just killed them all. And so the king said, well, we don't want divisive people. 
We don't want disrupt, disruptive, disloyal people. So here, here's the edict. You, you, you can kill them. And there's one thing I should tell you. The Persians had a law that once it was signed, it was pretty well irrevocable. So now that's the situation. You have this Jewish woman who's queen of Persia now. King doesn't know she's Jewish. And you have this wicked uh, four type of Hitler who somehow finagled away legally to kill all the Jews. Esther's parents are dead. She was raised by, it looks like maybe an uncle named Mordecai, who's a very godly man. Mordecai works the palace and he gets wind of what's gonna happen to the Jewish people. And he goes to, well, I mean, he can't really go see Esther, but the word gets to Esther that Mordecai is real sad about something. And so when Esther summons Mordecai, Mordecai says, look, there's this deal going down where all the Jewish people are gonna be killed and you need to do something about this. I should tell you something else about the law of the Persians. They had a law that if you went in to see the king without him giving you an appointment, you could be killed. It was the ultimate sign of disrespect to walk in and face the king. And so Esther said, look, I haven't been sent for, and if I go in there, I could be killed. Now, you sort of feel her reluctance at first, not seeing herself as a warrior. But, but look at what Mordecai said to her. If you keep quiet at a time like this, this is Esther 414. Deliverance and relief will arise from some other place. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I think this is really an important line. She said, my maids and I will do the same. And then though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. It's one of the most famous lines in all of history. The original language was, if I perish, I perish. Wow, we have seen Esther go from being a reluctant warrior to saying, whatever happens, happens. I'm going to put myself in God's hands. The rest is history. If you want to read the rest of the book, it's a great read. You can see how that Esther delivered by the grace and the power of God, delivered the entire Jewish nation. You might say that she was perhaps Israel's greatest warrior. There's another personality or another person in the Bible who has the same personality that I see. And this is a guy by the name of Gideon. <clears throat> Gideon was a leader. Well, he became a leader in Israel in a time when Israel was really, really weak. It was much like the United, where the United States is now. And because they were weak, God had allowed the Midianites, which was a very powerful people group to oppress Israel. And uh, so, you know, the people of Israel are poor, they're impoverished, the Midianites are coming, taking all their food, um, and they, they desperately needed deliverance. <laughs> and in the meantime, an angel of the Lord comes to Gideon, who is like trying to beat out a little bit of wheat. And the angel says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. <laughs> Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. Now listen to Gideon's reluctance. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest clan in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Well, there's some Bible history that indicates the tribe of Manasseh had been a little bit of an embarrassment to God's people by their weakness during this time. So in effect, Gideon is saying, I'm the last man in Israel you want. My tribe is kind of an embarrassment. My clan is the least tribe in Manasseh, and I'm the least member of my family. You ever feel like the last person in the world that God could use? But you know what happened. If you read Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8, you'll see that God used Gideon. He became one of the greatest heroes in the history of the Jewish nation. And a lot of, a lot of parents have named their, their sons Gideon because of this. Well, what are the lessons that someone who is a reluctant but victorious warrior can learn or use? Well, I just want to extract three things from these two stories. And the first one, I just want to say to all of you who are Esther's or Gideon's, your, your humility is a good thing. It's not exactly the worst trait in the world to feel that you're too small for the task that God has called you to. That's a good trait. I think this is one of the reasons why God calls a lot of you to center stage. Your humility is a good thing unless it turns into fear and shuts you down. You know, that's possible. A lot of times our good trait, our strength can actually become a weakness. And humility, feeling too small for the task is a wonderful trait. But if that morphs over into fear that shuts us down, 
then it turns into a bad thing. So your humility is a good thing. I want to pull the second one from Esther's story because Esther had a secret. She felt too small, too powerless to make a great difference. But when she decided to act on God's call in her life, she said to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Well, fasting is a time of prayer and just total focus on God. And I love this. Esther said, my maids and I will do the same thing. Esther is a very important person at this point. She's queen, you know? There are people in life who feel so important, they would say to others, you pray for me, but I'm not gonna pray. But not Esther. Esther said, please get everybody together and pray for me and I will pray too. And then she said, Again, though it's against the law, I'll go see the king. And if I die, I die. That's a really important message. In fact, you know, a whole lot can be said about that. And I'll try to just say this quickly. But what I see in Esther was, okay, if I'm, if I'm not up to this challenge, then God's going to have to do something that I can't do. Prayer is just so critically important. I said a few moments ago that I've watched this personality type in Mary Alice. And one of the things that's very true in her life is that prayer is so vitally important. And when I take this personality profile and think about what we've said, I understand now why prayer is just so critical to her. There is something about saying, I will take the step, but not until I spend some serious time with God about it. What I see with her when she says, I will pray, and then whatever happens, happens. I think about a godly leader here in the United States who's probably had as much influence on me as anyone else. Uh, I've talked a lot about Adrian Rogers and his influence on me. Another great leader is Charles Stanley. I started watching Charles Stanley sermons when I was in my early 20s. And I, I still, to this day, <clears throat> enjoy listening to him. But anyone who's ever listened to Charles Stanley's great ministry will know that his motto for life, and he says this over and over, you know, if someone asks him what his life is about and what, what he believes is important, he will say, trust God and leave the consequences to him. You really see that in Esther. Trust God and leave the consequences to him. I'll close with this. This third thing I see from Gideon, and Esther had this too, but the angel of God said to Gideon, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel. I am sending you. You know, for all of us who feel too small for the task that God has called us to, God doesn't ask us to go find strength that we don't have. He says, go in the strength that you have. And God said, I'm sending you. I'll take care of the rest of it. So for all of you reluctant, but uh, victorious warriors out there, trust God, leave the consequences with him. It's not the worst thing in the world to be humble and feel too small for the task. And then go with the strength you have. And one thing I watch in the lives of these great people is that oftentimes God begins to give them more strength and more capabilities the deeper they get into his work. You know, that's a, there, there's an old saying that's so very true. God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call. So I, I, I just pray for all of you who have this wonderful personality type that God will help you. And there's so many of you at, I know a lot of you are not at New Spring. You watch Noah's Window, but I know at New Spring, we just see so many of you and you, you do so much to change the world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the time that we've had in your word today. Thank you, Lord, that time after time, you reach down and you call very ordinary people to do very super ordinary things. And we just love watching these people partner with you and through their lives, you change the world. Now, we pray that you'll bless us all and help us and that you'll give us strength for this day. Help us to see our errors and our faults, that we may confess them and be in fellowship with you and then walk close to you in these difficult days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, thanks for joining us on Noah's Window. I'll be back with personality profile number four tomorrow, and uh, we'll just look forward to getting together then. May you have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.